the time I usually do these days. <clears throat> um, yeah, so exam will get graded. I've been updating. I don't remember if I've updated a whole lot for your stuff. Um, on the horizon, you've got the um, research paper not too far from now. That's, uh, oh my goodness, is that Tuesday of next week? So research paper comes up. We have after Thanksgiving, two weeks of scheduled class. So uh, my goal in making the due dates the way they were, I was hoping to get you done with the research paper so that you can focus on the research presentation and then have all that done so you can focus on the final exam. So uh, hopefully you've been making good progress on your research papers. Uh, if you have any questions or want to send me a draft and get some feedback on that, you can do that. Um, always happy to work, help work with you towards the final product on that. Uh, am I missing anything? Questions from you? So I think. I haven't checked on the grade book on Canvas. I want to make sure that the right about now, I'd like to get you a, a really clean, clear version of what your grade is at the moment. And I don't know if we're there right yet. So um, give me a minute or, or <laughs> give me a week and I'll hopefully get the grades ironed out and uh, have something good to show you there. And if nobody's got questions, we will forge ahead. All right, let's do it then. Share my screen. So we didn't quite make it through the secondary compounds topic. I'll uh, try to wrap that up. I also have, I'm not sure how much time we'll need for the uh, topic that's scheduled for today. So we'll just roll with it as we go. Uh, ah, yes, pick up our plants. Um, you can pick up your plants uh, in theory. Um, so I think they're basically, they've asked us not to have classes in person, but they're not especially preventing people from coming to campus. Uh, I'm here on our class days. If somebody wanted to make a plan to come to campus on a Tuesday or Thursday, they could come pick up a plant. Um, if you want me to watch your plants until the start of next semester, I can do that. So I guess the short answer is if you want to pick up one of the plants that I have from our lab work, um, let me know that you're still interested in having that and I will uh, work with you to find a time that, that works to come get it. You might want to have it for the holidays. I, one of the, my, my interesting, I don't know, one of my side purposes was uh, if you take this class and you end up having a plant, maybe it's a nice looking plant and you could give it as a gift for Christmas or something. Uh, so if that's if you want to have it before we break for the holidays, uh, let me know and we'll, we'll try to set something up. Um, I can also leave it somewhere for you in the building. If you don't want to see me while you're picking it up, I can just leave it somewhere. Uh, the building was pretty quiet to begin with, and now it's really quiet that nobody's supposed to be coming to class. Any other questions? All right, so I got the chat window up if you want to type in or you're always welcome to chime in with your microphone. All right. All right. So on the topic of so specialized compounds, we talked about uh, scents, flavors, and then it just gotten into defense, and that relates actually nicely to today's topic, which is uh, you know basically plants avoiding getting chewed on, <clears throat> or evidence we might see that plants are getting chewed on. I think I talked about this one. Maybe I didn't get up to this. Uh, so secondary compounds as a defense, these are molecules that might be uh, bitter or toxic to animals or other organisms that are trying to eat plants' tissues. Um, yeah, we did. I think we got up through this one, this idea of like, when would you make your defense compound as a plant? And this graph basically shows that plants don't start off really with enough resources to just jump out and defend themselves. Uh, and this kind of goes for the age of tissues as well. So uh, things that we eat, some of the plant material that we eat, you might enjoy eating it at a young stage, but you wouldn't put up with it at an older stage. So uh, I, 
fungus like baby spinach comes to mind uh, the delicate leaf uh, vegetable that you can have and it's it's a little bit easier on the palate it doesn't taste as bitter because it's younger tissue uh, if you got older spinach leaves then the plant has some time to invest in their defense uh, same thing for old and young plants so young plants uh, their immediate goals are getting bigger building those tissues that can get them to do photosynthesis. Um, and they kind of have to do that, hit the ground running, as it were, with, with growing. And then once they have the resources to defend themselves, then they can invest in defense chemicals. Um, and that's basically shown on this previous one as well. So uh, just different ages of plants. And as they get older, they get more bitter. So uh, this is why Animals often prefer eating younger tissue. This is why some of the plants that we eat, we eat the younger parts. Um, and, and it makes sense from the plant's perspective as well. So I guess if you're a young seedling and you're gonna get eaten, maybe that's just how it goes. Uh, but if you manage to survive being a seedling, then you have time to put in some uh, defense chemicals for yourself. Uh, let's see. You probably have a different chat window than I do. My chat window is covering things, but I don't think it's covering on your screen. So let me know if uh, you can't see something because it's being covered. I need another monitor that tells me what you're looking at. All right, so uh, kind of connected to the, today's topic of plant pathology, things that are eating plants and how to identify them. Uh, the secondary chemicals, of course, relate to that process. Kind of like this little cartoon if you're fond of plants do you tell people to stop being vegetarians so plants have um, some interesting strategies that are related to secondary compounds specialized compounds um, it's basically you, you get into you're kind of opening the door to this big evolutionary conversation right so how does evolution work to keep organisms alive and, and how have they figured out interesting ways to stay alive. Um, here's one where this plant uh, produces a chemical that the animals that eat parts of this plant, they get the chemical and it's a smelly chemical and it basically like flags them with the smell that makes them appealing to predators. So uh, plants might be smelly and that draws things to come and try to eat them. Uh, animals, if they're smelly in the wrong way, they can also draw animals to eat them. And so the plant is basically saying, all right, you can eat uh, part of me. And actually it's related to these uh, glandular hairs. This is a plant in the same, fam uh, same genus as tobacco. Uh, it has these glandular hairs and uh, they're quite a choice treat for the caterpillar and the caterpillar eats them and then part of what's in there, in addition to the food that's tasty, is this chemical that's smelly. And in this case, these ants are drawn to the scent to attack the herbivores. So kind of a scent signal uh, calling for someone to eat the animals that are eating you. And there are a few different examples of this. This is just one I chose for today, but kind of an interesting, just interesting uh, ecology question. Uh, as far as different kinds of molecules, some of these are directly involved in protection. So molecules that are toxic uh, include this class of molecules, the terpenoids. These are some of the more smelly compounds. Uh, we talked in the lab about molecules that are volatile. Uh, so present in the plant tissues, but if you damage the plant tissues, these evaporate a little more readily. Um, and that's related to some of the smells that we get. So if you want to smell mint, right? Let's say you get fresh mint and you want to smell that, you take the mint leaf and you crush it up and you get this lovely smell of mint. Uh, same thing with citrus. One of the distinctive smells of citrus is this molecule called limonene or uh, pyrethrin for a different kind of plant. Uh, these are in the terpenoid category of this uh, aromatic organic molecule uh, chemistry. And there are lots of terpenoid, terpenoids out there. So this is from a, a paper called, Why Are There So Many Terpenoids? Why do plants produce so many terpenoid compounds? Uh, we'll see examples where they are uh, good for defense. Uh, also, some of them involved in signaling. 
And I don't know. Why do you suppose there are so many different ways chemically to defend yourself as a plant? What do you think? All right, I'm going to suffer through some more of my plant drawings. Let's see, all right, some predators get used to it. I think we're on to a good track here. Uh, it's called herbivore. So uh, let's imagine there was a world where all plants defended themselves with the same chemical. Right, so chemical defense, um, we're not going to go into the details of them, but they, in a lot of cases, they rely on a specific effect. So, um, disabling the function of an enzyme or uh, something like that um, is, is very specific chemical interaction. And if you are eating something that is toxic to you, evolution can in many ways, in many cases, work around that. So like, okay, well, I can't eat this plant because it's gonna disable this enzyme. I either uh, maybe figure out a different way to do what that enzyme did, or I can uh, modify the enzyme to so that it's not sensitive to the plant chemical. And so plants can basically work, or, or herbivores can work around uh, plant defenses a little bit. And this relates to something that you might have encountered in another class, an evolutionary arms race. Heard of it? So this idea of uh, arms race, kind of an older concept in uh, geopolitical history. Um, so one, uh, say the plant is defending itself, comes up with a new defense strategy. Uh, that, if this animal is going to survive by eating that plant, it's got to figure out a way around that. So it's sort of a, a back and forth of defense and working around the defense um, through different ways, chemical and sometimes mechanical or maybe behavioral. And so you end up with uh, maybe one of these strategies, one of these food items that is um, let's say this this particular herbivore has a good way to get around the defenses of plant A. Uh, that might mean that it's not as good at getting around the defenses of plant B and plant C. So if all these different plant species have different defense strategies, then uh, the ways that one herbivore gets around them are not universally going to uh, defeat the defenses of all plants. And so this is really one of the big reasons why there are so many different defensive chemicals. They all might be toxic in their own ways to herbivores, and uh, it's important for them to have different strategies for that. So that's one of the reasons. There'd be other reasons as well that terpenoids are not only involved in defense, but also signaling. So it's a big world out there. Um, so I think I mentioned also a lot of these kind of smelly plants have molecules that we find interesting, right, or appealing. We make perfumes out of things. We put them in our food so the food smells good or tastes good. 
uh, that's not a great strategy for a plant, right? So if, if the mint plant was, uh, you know, if we were its target herbivore and it was trying to defend against us, it's probably not great for mint to be so tasty, <laughs> kind of backwards. Uh, so it's, it's appealing to us, but it really has more of a, a much different primary function would be to defend the plant against things that are more often eating it in a natural setting. And um, so there's evidence, of course, that this is an effective defense strategy. Uh, this is from one study that shows the concentration of the defensive compounds in this pennyroyal plant <clears throat> uh, connected with the uh, survival of a uh, insect herbivore. So as the concentration of these plant extracts, their active chemicals goes up, uh, that affects the survival of the thing that's trying to eat them. Uh, and not just a little bit, right? So we have got up to almost 70% survival at the low concentration down to less than 20% survival. So clear uh, effect on the survival of things that are eating it. So I guess Next time you're you're putting herbs together for your Thanksgiving dinner, think about all the insects that might be suffering if they were trying to eat your Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, other connections, again, this is sort of it's sort of a, a quaint little novelty. The things that we eat that have interesting flavors, but uh, just sort of a illustration of the wide variety. Uh, these are produced by the plants to defend themselves in most cases, and then we just find them interesting. So uh, I guess I put this together as a something that might be of interest to the average college student. So different uh, flavorful alcoholic beverages and the plants that they come from. So uh, during one of our field trips, I think I pointed out juniper berries. So this is a conifer that makes uh, fleshy cones and juniper is related to the word gin actually. It's an origin. And then other ones kind of, uh, distinctive flavors around and the plants that produce those flavors. And then over on the right, the chemicals that are uh, largely responsible for the flavors. Uh, I talked previously about tannins way back when we were talking about how cells are put together and I mentioned the tannosome. Uh, tannins are a type of molecule uh, often impart more of a bitterness. So uh, tannins in food, uh, if you've eaten a, an unripe banana, in my mouth, it, it gets this kind of like cottony flavor. It's like I'm eating something that's not quite food. Uh, that is the presence of tannins. And uh, in some cases, that can be a nice deterrent if, uh, say, you've offering, if you're a plant and you're offering a, a fruit. Um, unripe fruits often have more tannins, and those go away over time uh, as the the fruits get ripened and the plant is basically okay with somebody eating them. So uh, in the banana example, for me, an unripe banana tastes pretty, pretty yucky. Uh, I like my bananas more on the ripe side. And as they get more ripe, they're uh, sweeter and less bitter. Um, acorns, if you wonder why people can't eat acorns, they're pretty high in tannins. And so that's a nut that's full of uh, nutrient food, but it's one that the tannins would really prevent us from enjoying the eating experience. So uh, we are basically prevented from eating acorns. Uh, other bits that are shown on this slide here, tannins give the brown color to leaves. So leaves, of course, having this bitter chemical as a deterrent to things trying to eat it. And then uh, certain places at this time of year or a little bit before, as the leaves fall, uh, sometimes the leaves with tannins in them, the tannins leach out into the water supply and you get this like iced tea color in uh, water. So streams running with this like frothy brown color. Uh, that is the basically the, the tannin, which is also a pigment color coming out of the leaves and, and dyeing it, uh, which is related, very similar to what happens with tea leaves. So when we have tea, uh, the tea flavor comes from tannins and other molecules. Uh, very similar thing. We take leaves, brush them up, soak them in water, changes color, imparts a bitter flavor. Uh, very similar to what's shown in the river here. And then uh, another tannin example is the seed, or the, sorry, the flesh, sorry, deep breath. Uh, the skin of a, a grape is what gives the 
color and some bitterness to wine. So another tannin example there. Uh, alkaloids are a kind of molecule. Um, these are a little bit different. You'll notice there are nitrogen atoms in the alkaloid molecules. So that's common to uh, what it means to be an alkaloid. Um, these have, the ones that I've shown you, have an effect on the nervous system. Uh, I was going to say of vertebrates, but also across other animals. Uh, so these are molecules that kind of interact with nerve transmission. Um, caffeine, for example, is uh, it interferes with our molecular signal that tells us we're tired. So this caffeine molecule gets in there and uh, blocks that signal. So this is why you can drink coffee and not feel as tired. Uh, other ones of these, nicotine, the active chemical in tobacco, cocaine, morphine. Um, just skip over these. Uh, morphine is from the poppy plant, and it's named for uh, Morpheus, who is the god of sleep. So opium, poppies, opium has uh, morphine and similar chemicals, and then you can get these uh, enriched as uh, something like heroin is sourced from opium poppies, as well as some uh, medically useful painkillers like morphine and um, this whole uh, the current uh, crisis they call opioids, right? So these drugs that are opioids. Um, poppy is the source of opium, which was a drug from centuries before, a couple centuries before. Um, and modifications of opium, basically the, the molecules, the alkaloids that come from the poppies, uh, those can become even stronger drugs as we purify them and alter them chemically. Uh, and they feature in a lot of painkillers now in, in a way that people are uh, a little bit not, not so sure they want that these days. Anyway, uh, so these are produced by some plants. Here's an interesting connection to one of those alkaloids, uh, caffeine, right? So again, these plants are not making the molecules for our benefit. Uh, I don't imagine the caffeine in a coffee plant was put there so that a person would go and harvest the beans and roast them up. Um, but it does have a connection to pollinators. So it turns out that caffeine as a uh, nerve transmission molecule actually affects the way that bees remember. And so this graph here at the lower right, this is showing um, the bees memory for where it's been uh, after 10 minutes is pretty strong all across the board. These are the white boxes and memory after 24 hours in the presence of caffeine pretty high so it stays about the same uh, but in the absence of caffeine so low concentrations and the absence of caffeine uh, the memory for where the bee has been goes down by about half so it turns out that caffeine helps you remember if you're a bee i don't know if this <laughs> translates out to people uh, caffeine, another interesting connection here. So we are familiar with it from coffee. Uh, tea also has caffeine. Uh, chocolate has caffeine. And these are all in different parts of the flowering plant family tree. So uh, coffee is a distant relative to cacao for chocolate, which is a distant relative to the tea plant. Uh, other plants that are known to make caffeine include yerba mate, which is a, it's actually related to holly, uh, guarana, and uh, another, one of the plants in the citrus genus actually produces caffeine. So kind of a convergent evolution there. Uh, related to what we talked about with making these molecules, right? So they're uh, specialized secondary molecules, but they're built on common molecules. So it's possible for plants independently to figure out how to make these uh, molecules from uh, a lot of cases from the same starting point. Uh, I mentioned the opioid painkilling drugs. There are also plenty of drugs that people use that are um, sourced from plants. And uh, a lot of these like toxic to us in the natural plant. So uh, foxglove is a toxic plant, 
and it has an effect on uh, heart rhythm. And so a person can eat foxglove and have their heart stop. Or in a medical situation, you can basically harness the power of that, and it's a, a treatment that's used for uh, certain types of heart conditions. So um, good job medicine, figuring out kind of alternative uses for things that are downright toxic. Uh, this one's an a anti-cancer drug called Taxol, sourced from the yew plant. This is a, a very toxic plant, but uh, in the right situation under the correct dosage and administration, these can be uh, used to treat certain types of cancer. Uh, maybe a little more friendly example, if you have a runny nose or sinus issues, uh, this is a, a stimulant molecule that can be taken as an extract from uh, this plant called ephedra. This is actually a gymnosperm, so a relative of the conifers. Uh, there's its naked seed in there, and it's got a fleshy, sort of fleshy leaves around the side to attract uh, birds to disperse these. And extract of that uh, from ephedra, we get an extract called ephedrine. And the uh, trade name Sudafed is basically a take on uh, pseudoephedrine, pseudoephedrine, right? Sudafed, pseudoephedrine. Now you know. So affects your sinuses. So the list could go on quite a bit. If you think about human drugs, uh, what is a drug? A drug is a molecule that has a biological effect uh, on the cells of a person or on uh, sometimes on say parasites or organisms that might be affecting the person. And there's just a really wide variety of uses. So when people look at plants, they often say, uh, often a lead in is like, all right, nice plant. What can I do with it? And uh, it turns out with a lot of plants, there are many plants around the world, but a lot of them, you can do something with them besides eat them. Uh, and this was a plant that was discovered as a treatment for leprosy. So just sort of little, little tidbits here and there. Uh, this is one a student brought to my attention. This is a plant in the euphorb family. So uh, plants that look like cactus, but are actually in a different family from cactus. This one has a molecule that is, uh, it rates on the hotness scale. So the, like the spiciness, hotness scale, like chili peppers, except it rates so high that it is like so hot. It, as it says here, destroys nerve endings. Um, and this, this ability is actually used by uh, medical professionals to treat uh, pain, I believe it, like sort of kill pain receptors in this way. So the list goes on, right? So that was that topic. Um, it's kind of ends with a lot of different molecules that are specifically active in interesting biological ways. Um, maybe you can see a little bit of a connection. So something that makes this plant seem like it's very, very, very spicy, would make this even more distasteful to animals. Uh, some of these other ones, <clears throat> like a, a stimulant molecule that clears up your sinus, I don't know if that's uh, the so-called intended purpose of this one. All right, questions on that topic? Pretty quiet out there. Can finally drink water while I'm presenting. All right, moving on to the next topic. Um, so we'll just uh, this one might go long. Also, we'll just stop wherever we end, wherever we run out of time. Um, but this one actually builds nicely on the topic of plant defense. So we see chemicals as involved in plant defense. Uh, this topic is coming back around to plants that are suffering, basically. So the field of plant pathology. Uh, pathology, maybe you've had to go through a pathologist in your lifetime. Uh, if you have a 
something tissue, they get biopsied or something, they send it to a pathologist. And in humans, pathology is like, what's wrong with you? And it's related to this Greek word pathos, uh, related to sympathy, so feeling or, or suffering. So what do plants suffer from? What does a plant suffer from? All right, so tissue damage. Diseases, parasites. Uh, I guess a lot of it comes down to being eaten. So parasites, you probably wouldn't count in the herbivore category. Smaller organisms, bacteria. Right, so uh, I think we often think about plants as the base of the food chain and rightfully so, right? So when we talk about uh, nutrients, in an ecological community, then plants are the organism that's making the food for a lot of those other parts of the community. So uh, plants definitely get eaten uh, through bacteria, microbes, and we'll throw fungus in there too, fungi. Uh, tissue damage, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll talk about that as uh, another form of plant pathology. So uh, there are people who are plant pathologists. Maybe you uh, see yourself heading in that direction as a career. I don't know how well they get paid, but I, I imagine they get paid pretty well. Like if you are uh, basically like the plant doctor who can look at a plant and say, I know what's wrong with your plant, uh, certainly in a, a crops or a horticulture context, that would be agriculture or horticulture. Uh, that would be a desirable thing to have information about. And uh, a lot of times it does come down to what is the organism that is eating my plant, uh, but not always. So let's see what we got here in the old slide packet. So uh, one thing that's outside of the realm of being eaten is just a plant that's maybe in an environment that it can't can't do well enough in. So um, could be some of these more abiotic problems. Uh, we talked when we talked about nutrients, so soil nutrients that plants need, they can be short on those nutrients and show that as their, uh, like manifest that in the, the color of their leaves or something like that. So an illustration here of a plant that's got a uh, magnesium deficiency, this was one of our uh, mobile nutrients, if you remember that. So a nice illustration, this is um, yellowing in the older leaves. So what's happening here is this plant is short on magnesium. Uh, and I only know that because they told me this when I got the image. But it's uh, short on magnesium, it's taking it from the older leaves and shuttling it out to the new growth. So these new leaves are okay, they're doing nicely, good shade of green. Uh, these new leaves, good shade of green, but the older leaves are yellow. So this is a plant that's uh, it's got, got only so much magnesium to go around, it's sacrificing older tissue so that it can keep growing toward, uh, maybe toward new light sources or something like that. So this is one way you might see a plant 
uh, so-called suffering that's different from just being eaten. Uh, if you have some nutrients, you can have too many nutrients. So it's possible to get too many nutrients and have that be a problem. Uh, this is a lot of times like an osmotic problem. So uh, roots maybe being unable to take up water because there are too many salts in the soil, uh, maybe upsetting the chemical balance inside of cells. So uh, if you fertilize your plants, you might uh, be at risk sometimes of over fertilizing them. And this is what could happen. So uh, just like us, if you, if you had too much salt in your diet, uh, that affects your body's ability to make use of the water that you have. And people can die if they, eat, you know, say you're uh, stranded on the ocean and you drink only salt water, that, that uh, will kill a person. So same thing for a plant. If it's only taking up salty water, lots of cellular damage there. Anybody have a lawn that looks like this? What causes your lawn to look like this? Sometimes you're in. So I, I love the internet. You can always find something useful, right? So uh, people who are advocating that maybe we should be putting urine onto our plants. Um, I, I think I have this on here to make the point that a little bit is okay. A little bit can be good. So a lot of uh, animal waste is positive input for a plant, right? So a uh, big component of urine is uh, ammonia. Ammonia has usable nitrogen, plants like nitrogen. So from that perspective, nitrogen good, add some nitrogen to your plants, they can benefit from that. Um, too much nitrogen, so if you have an animal that is causing some uh, burned spots in your yard. This might be due to a uh, dog in your house peeing in spots. So dog urine can cause uh, burn in the in the lawn. So it's too too salty for too long in that area that can kill the grass in that spot. So everything in moderation, right? Another form of damage that's not caused by animals. Uh, temperature extremes, so plants wilting, I think we probably have some familiar, familiarity with plants that wilt when they have too little water. Uh, this is a plant that's not adapted to live in uh, cold areas where frost happens. So if you have any avocado plants outside right now, they're probably, they're probably not doing very well. Uh, so as a plant that's native to tropical areas, this one doesn't lose its leaves. It's not preparing for winter. Caught completely on off guard. Um, sometimes this happens if you live in an area that doesn't usually get frost, and sometimes it does get frost. This can happen. Um, so uh, this is basically like localized damage to cells of the leaf. Um, and then pretty widespread. So it looks like these leaves will probably individually die at the end of this process. So most of what we talk about when we talk about pathology would be, uh, as we introduced already, uh, organisms that are basically eating the plant. So we'll uh, spend a bit of time talking about animals that are herbivores. So animals that eat plants, that's a lot of animals. A lot of animals of different sizes. So uh, I want to take the time today to, to kind of split out these different sizes, different eating strategies of these different animals. Uh, I'm not really planning to train any pathologists today, but uh, hopefully maybe just give you, give you an introduction to the variety of um, pathology examples you might encounter. And maybe if you're kind of interested, maybe set you on your way to learning more about this. So we have animals that eat like whole plants all the way down to smaller animals that might be nibbling on parts of plants. So start off with a little more of the familiar version. Uh, big animals taking pieces of plants that they chomp with their big teeth. 
So I think that's probably a fairly easy way to look at a plant and say, yeah, something has chewed this plant. So whole organs are missing. Uh, sometimes, as we just talked about with the uh, secondary compounds, maybe selectively eating the younger tissue of a plant. Uh, you'd see uh, biting or tearing marks on this plant in the place where the, the chewing has happened. <clears throat> and I guess you prevent against this by excluding somebody. Um, so deer, this is a study from Wisconsin. Uh, you probably encountered deer as a major influencer of plant communities. Has that come up for anybody before? Anybody have deer eat their plants at home? So we have uh, in Wisconsin and many parts of the country, uh, a lot more deer than would be naturally present. So the uh, predators have been removed. There are wolves in northern Wisconsin, but mostly not wolves around and not animals that are really uh, putting predator pressure on deer. So in the absence of predators, these deer are uh, more abundant and they got to eat stuff. And they are animals with brains. They get to choose what is more optimal for them to eat. So it's turned into an interesting uh, area of study. Like, all right, we have a lot of deer. What do they eat? What do they eat more of? What do they eat less of? Uh, maybe you've had this in your garden, right? You put plants in. You can buy plants from the store that say they're deer proof, right? So you buy plants that are uh, bitter, toxic thorny, tough. Uh, some of those plants will be uh, protected against deer, and it basically amounts to being less tasty than the other stuff around. So uh, given a selection of plants to chew on, the deer will opt for something that's easier to eat. Uh, so less bitter, less toxic, less thorny, less tough. And uh, over the amount of time that we've had lots of deer, so this like post, uh, post settlement era where we've let the deer numbers get high, uh, the wolf numbers have been down, there's a, a long term effect where some of these plants, some of these, a lot of cases, native plants are being uh, unfairly eaten or, or disproportionately eaten than other uh, native and sometimes non native plants. So this was a study from 2014, and they put some species into the categories of winners and losers. Uh, so to do this experiment, you can basically take areas where there are deer and uh, areas where you exclude deer and compare the plant communities as far as who survives and uh, who maybe doesn't. So uh, just a, a section from that study, winners and losers, and I've illustrated some of them here. Uh, this is a non-native plant we call hawkweed, Heracea marantiacum, a native um, anemone plant. And then over here on the right side are some of the losers. Uh, a lot of times some of our, I don't know, I guess they end up becoming more rare plants because they're disproportionately destroyed by deer. So large animals, pretty easy to see the effects of that. Uh, kind of intermediate size, so there are insects that are smaller animals themselves, but their chewing strategies are similar to what we see in the big herbivores. So i uh, pick some examples of insects that uh, we see evidence of their damage by like chewing. They're chewing holes in leaves or chewing up uh, entire leaves a little bit at a time. And among those, one you might be familiar with in your garden, a lot of our problem insects are non-native insects. So this is one uh, not from here, Japanese beetle. This is one that's uh, very abundant at a certain time of year and doesn't seem to be too picky about what it eats. So if you get this on plants, they're pretty pretty thorough at chewing holes in leaves. Um, and they, they just are really abundant. And uh, I got a a map of where the old Japanese beetles were. This is from 2015. So you're probably, if you live around this area, 
Uh, you probably encountered your share of Japanese beetles, and I didn't check up on the updated map, but I'm sure it's much more purple in our area than it used to be in 2015. So, as far as I, as far as I know, still marching their way across and destroying all kinds of plants in the process. Thanks, Japanese beetle. Uh, even smaller. Uh, there are animals that, uh, this is a kind of animal called a thrips. It's the same thing in the singular and plural. One thrips, two thrips. Uh, these are pretty small. I don't have a scale bar here, but you can kind of gauge maybe by the uh, size of these plant hairs. So much smaller than the Japanese beetle. And uh, their feeding strategy a lot of times is this kind of looks more like they've scraped a portion of the surface. So they're uh, not like taking off, cutting holes into leaves, but more kind of scraping it up. So an example of thrips damage. Uh, another small insect. Ended up uh, a lot of the stuff I put on here, pests we see in the greenhouse. So I don't know how much you encounter these in your own plants, but uh, if you come down to the greenhouse sometime, I can show you all kinds of pests. And this is one of the ones we have called a spider mite. Uh, it is an arachnid and it makes a web. And uh, they're very tiny. And then in their web, they chew up the plant. So you can see it's, if you wanted to use your pathology smarts to know what's destroying your plant, then <laughs> finding a web like this would probably be a, a decent indication you're looking at spider mites. So those were uh, herbivores of different sizes. And we talked earlier about being specialized. Uh, here are some examples of specialized herbivores. And I chose some that have, basically have the name of the thing they eat in their name. So potato beetle uh, is fond of oak trees. No, wait, potatoes. So potato beetle, fond of potato plants. Tomato hornworm, you might've seen on your tomato plants and so on. So again, relating to what we talked about before, um, this idea that one herbivore will be more effective at uh, basically working around the defenses of a particular plant and will basically evolve to specialize on that plant. So uh, keying into like modifying its behavior so that it's drawn to that plant so that it exclusively visits that plant and you get to a situation where uh, these animals are really dependent on that plant for their food. So uh, it could be because there's a particular kind of defense that needs to be worked around, or it could just be that they've developed that as their uh, specialized plant of preference. So one of our more notorious uh, plants with specialist herbivores on it, uh, well, not just one species, but we have a few species of milkweed. And milkweeds, if you've encountered them, they are very toxic to insects. So they get the name milkweed because they have milky sap that comes out. Uh, I made the mistake one time, I got some sap on my hands and forgot about it and then touched my tongue with that hand and it was pretty gross. So bitter, uh, a lot of alkaloids in there, uh, defense molecules. And so your average like herbivore off the street would not be able to eat this plant without experiencing the toxic effects. Uh, but it's sort of a sort of a flip flop. So as a plant that was not being eaten for the most part, uh, it was sort of a, a food resource that was uh, available if somebody could figure out a way around it. And it turns out there's quite a few. So uh, maybe you're familiar with the monarch caterpillar. That's one of the more uh, notorious eaters of milkweeds. Uh, it's an animal that turns into a lovely butterfly that people often are interested in. Nice looking caterpillar. Uh, it's got a strategy for eating around the uh, parts of this plant that uh, produce the, the milky sap. Other ones, we've got aphids, bugs, caterpillars, beetles. 
And uh, another connection here is a lot of these are brightly colored. So a lot of these animals, uh, in addition to basically eating the toxic plant, are able to take some of the toxins from the plant and put them into their body. So colorful animals sometimes can be a sign to uh, animals that eat them that they are not good to eat. I think I wanted one other one on here. Hold on. Give you a little video break here. And to understand the factors that uh, are contributing to the decline, characterized by being rather hostile environments for the insects that consume them. Uh, it's a hard life for some of the insects that eat milkweed. There, you can see here there's a monarch butterfly caterpillar starting its life on a swamp milkweed. And they face several barriers to feeding when they start feeding on a plant like this. And the picture starts very innocently sometime in June, typically in, in central New York, um, adult monarch butterfly adult monarch butterfly that migrates up from Mexico will lay an egg on, on a plant like this. And from that innocent beginning, the egg hatches. And the first barrier to feeding that that caterpillar faces is, are what we call trichomes. They're leaf hairs. Um, and often, especially on the common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, the monarch will shave a shave a bed, uh, removing all the trichomes on the leaf, and it's it's truly remarkable because that caterpillar has is getting no nutrition from eating the, from cutting those trichomes. Um, it has not fed at all yet; it's just hatched from its egg, and before it can get any nutrients out of the leaf, it must kind of clear that slate. Once the caterpillar uh, shaves the lawn, uh, it sinks its mandibles into the leaf, and it's faced with a very toxic, gluey, gummy substance we call latex. Latex is an amazing plant defense because about 10% of plants have latex, not just milkweeds, but 10% of all plants. Uh, if you break a dandelion stem, you'll notice a little white milky substance. If you've uh, eaten a broken leaf off of a fig tree or a euphorb, many house plants have latex. And latex is a tremendous barrier to feeding. It gums up the mouth parts. It would be like uh, he scaled things up, getting a gallon of paint thrown into your face as you're trying to eat dinner. And not only is it a gummy, gluey substance um, that gels, it gets very, it coagulates upon exposure to the air, but also it is packed full of toxins. From an insect's perspective, the cells, all of the cells in the animal's body basically stop functioning normally when they are getting these uh, cardiac glycosides or the Cardinolides, that's the, uh, the, the scientific name for the compounds. And uh, only insects that have a special adaptation, it's a single genetic change uh, in the monarch butterfly, only insects that have that special uh, adaptation are able to feed on these plants. So you'll find many, many of the insects in this field simply do not touch milkweed uh, because of those potent toxins. Nonetheless, if you look at the leaves, you'll see that there's plenty of damage uh, on the leaves, and that's because there is a community of insects that specializes and only feeds on these plants. All right, I think that's probably good for now. Okay, so uh, milkweed is kind of notorious as one of this one of these really toxic plants that, nonetheless, animals have figured their way around. Uh, so I mentioned specialized insect herbivores. Uh, lots of examples, again, with animals that have the plant name in their name. Uh, so the cotton bull weevil. This is a, a, a beetle known as a weevil that's a herbivore of cotton plants. So this is a, a developing fruit of a cotton plant. This is one that's been infested by the weevil. Uh, cotton is a, a crop in southern United States, and so uh, this is one that can destroy crops as this insect goes out of control and 
destroys a whole bunch. So graph here of uh, progress on the goal to eradicate southern United States of the bull weevil. Uh, one of the strategies is shown here. This is a pheromone trap. So you can like trick the animals to coming to somewhere. You can collect them by uh, giving them a chemical they're really attracted to, like a pheromone here. Uh, another one that's more local here. This is the emerald ash borer. Um, I think I pointed out some of this to people on field trips. This is one that's just gotten really, really thorough uh, damage to the ash trees in our area. We have different species of ash tree and uh, cultivated and wild, and they've just all been just knocked out uh, by this animal, which is a, uh, in the larval stage, gets into the bark, the, the uh, juicy living layer of a tree, and the larvae go through and just eat all through there and uh, basically destroying the connection, the living tissue between the roots and the leaves of the plant. And this kills the plant. Um, and I don't see the date on this. 2018, so there's a, a map of 2018. There was a, a portion of states that was sometimes being quarantined. And uh, since that time, Wisconsin is entirely given over to the infestation and map is, is just getting bigger every year. So no signs of slowing for the old emerald ash borer. Uh, another version of being specialized is a specialized feeding strategy. And I'll talk about a few of those here. Uh, one of those is called leaf mining. And I think I pointed out one of these on the videos uh, way back when it was one of the field trips. And I think I might've shown this to people in person uh, leaf mining is a neat strategy where, uh, again, larvae of insects, they get into the middle layer of a leaf. So inside of the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis is a lot of juicy tissue. Those are the cells that do photosynthesis. And if the plant's defense has to do with the cuticle or uh, something about the epidermal cells, then once the insect is inside of that layer, uh, then basically the cuticle defense is no longer defending and the animals just in there eating. Uh, another advantage here is that an insect inside of a plant might be harder for a predator to get access to. So say you're a bird or something trying to get this insect in there, uh, it might be harder to, to get inside of the leaf in order to get the food that's in there. Uh, and another interesting one more interesting bit about these is the, the track uh, shows you where the herbivore has been, the leaf miner. And a lot of times there is this like streak of basically it's poop <laughs> where this uh, larval grub has gone through <clears throat> eating and pooping just nonstop. Uh, sometimes you see the line, the, the mine actually get bigger as you see evidence of the insect growing up. So leaf mining, here's some examples of uh, mining insects. So this is the adult stage where they would be able to fly. And at their larval stage, that's when they would be doing the leaf mining. So a lot of these are, um, I think we have, these are moths. So like a sort of caterpillar is doing the mining. This is a fly that has a, a larva that does leaf mining. Uh, you don't need to know anything about these. Certainly, I don't know much about them. But uh, if you are interested in insects or entomology, you might be a little more keen to recognize what these are. Uh, another form of specialized herbivory is gall formation. And uh, I tried to point some of these out in the field as well. Um, a gall is basically a, a plant tumor that is induced by an insect. So the insect. Um, I guess there's some that are induced by fun fungus as well. Um, the the gall is tissue that uh, basically increases in size due to the uh, what the adult insect puts in there. So it puts an egg in, and then also uh, chemicals that cause this change to happen in the plant growth. So these are not uh, not what would be formed naturally in the course of life of these different plants. But uh, sometimes they look 
like deceptively intentional. Like this one here, this is a, a gall on a willow. It looks like a little pine cone kind of thing. Uh, but that's produced only in response to the uh, the eggs that are laid in there. So what a gall does is it grows a lot of tissue, uh, usually kind of a spherical tissue. Inside of there would be one or more eggs and the larvae, uh, the eggs hatched and the larvae have food to eat because the plant has grown more tissue in that area. Uh, they have protection from the outside because they're disguised inside of plant material. And uh, they could potentially also be protected against, say, the winter. So in this goldenrod example, uh, there'd be a grub that was able to eat during the growing portion, growing season of this plant. And then as we approach winter, this is fairly protected against the elements. Um, so a nice little safe winter home that the uh, adult can burrow out of in the spring. And these are, there's a big variety of uh, gall forming insects. So again, a lot of uh, variety. These are the ones I have on here. We've got a wasp. Uh, the ones that are midges and flies, these are in the fly, the dipterin group of uh, insects and then wasps. So flies and wasps, and then uh, actually the, the insects and then the galls that they form. Uh, and they get named for the things they make. So the honey locust pod gall midge, the goldenrod gall fly, the oak apple gall wasp. A um, little bit interesting name here, the oak apple. So oaks do not make apples, but uh, they make, if they're stung by these gall insects, they make these spherical galls that kind of look like apples, I suppose. Don't eat them. All right, I skipped a little bit, go back to that. Uh, so different galls, uh, nice video here, highlighting some other types of galls. Plenty of animals build their homes in oak trees, but it's another thing entirely to get the oak tree to do all the work, to build your house for you. Say you're an oak tree, just sitting there minding your own business, when suddenly this tiny wasp comes along. She says, hey, why don't you build me a nursery for these baby wasps I'm about to have? And then she injects her eggs under your skin. You find yourself creating an entirely new structure, when you would have never built for yourself. What nerve, you might say, what gall, and you'd be right. This thing, this parasitic wasp house, it's called a gall. There can be dozens of types of galls on a single tree, each one built to order for a specific species of wasp. They're called gall-inducing wasps, and each gall is weirder and more flamboyant than the next. Sometimes the wasps prefer a mobile home. This one is called a jumping gall. It falls from the tree and bounces across the ground like a Mexican jumping bean until it finds a safe place to hatch. As a protection against predators, galls can taste incredibly bitter. Bitter like the bile produced by a gall bladder. In fact, the earliest doctors believed being bitter and angry meant an excess of gall in the body. Anyway, Back to our tree. Inside the gall, the larvae mature and develop. And as they grow, they release chemicals that tell the tree how to build the gall. The tree is tricked into funneling nutrients into the gall to feed the hungry wasp larvae. Scientists call this a physiologic sink. For the larvae, it's like living inside a giant banana, an endless supply of food. But the peace and quiet don't last long. All that free food starts attracting uninvited guests. That original wasp itself becomes a host for another set of wasps called parasitoids. One study in the UK found 17 different wasp species living in one gall. But the oak tree, it does just fine. In most cases, unharmed by the tiny rivalries in tiny houses on its branches and its leaves. Okay, so the video uh, suggests there that um, 
having galls is uh, what she said, a nutrient sink, energy sink. So it's, uh, as she also said, basically the, the effect is, it looks kind of negligible from the outside, right? So we see galls on plants and they continue to grow. So there's golden rods with big galls on them. They still have leaves and flowers and reproduce just fine. Oak trees with galls on them still have new growth and leaves and fruits. Uh, but it does have a measurable effect on energy. So uh, showing a difference between plants with galls on them and plants without galls uh, have lower amounts for some of these amounts uh, that were measured. So carbohydrates in different situations. So a little bit of an effect, uh, enough to make a difference maybe long-term. But uh, as a parasite, so if these gall forming insects are parasites, then it's actually in their interest not to be too harmful to their source, right? So if you killed a plant as part of parasitizing it, uh, that might affect your chances of having a place to parasitize in the next year. So it's sort of uh, in the best interest not to have a big effect on the thing they're eating. All right, so saw those, saw that one. Uh, kind of an interesting thing I found a few years back. Um, you can see evidence of these gall and leaf mining interactions way back in time. So this is 50 million years ago, uh, a leaf fossil that shows all kinds of evidence. And this kind of made, made for an interesting study that they found just so many different kinds of uh, parasites taking over this one leaf, one fossil with lots of different evidence. Um, it puts the pieces together for a lot of these different interactions. Um, other types of a little more specialized feeding. So we've seen examples of animals that are chewing, basically. Uh, there's a different kind of feeding, which is to suck out the sugar rich juice of a plant. So uh, taking nectar out of plants, that is the special domain of aphids and their relatives. And they're part of a group of insects that have basically a straw, piercing straw for a feeding apparatus. So they pierce into the plant, uh, they connect into the phloem where the sugar is, and they just kind of sit on the plant and take, take that sugar water out. So illustrated here, uh, the aphid piercing in until it gets to the sugar rich cells and then basically like taps into that and continues to draw off the sugar water over time. And uh, interesting kind of side effect, I mentioned this to some people who were on a field trip, um, that aphids will produce what we call honeydew, uh, which is the fanciest thing I've ever, fanciest way I've ever seen to describe poop. Uh, so their diet is rich in sugar. It's so rich in sugar that the other molecules they need, proteins and, and other nutrients, uh, relative to the amount of sugar, there's not as much protein. There's some in there, but they, they do need that. They need sugar, but they also need water and proteins and other molecules. So they actually end up like filtering out the sugar so they can take more of the, the, the molecules that are more scarce. So the sugar is like a waste product. They have too much, too much sugar. So they poop out liquid that is mostly sugar. And that's just their poop. It's the thing they don't need, but it is quite appealing to other animals. So there are uh, ants that commonly will come and uh, they say they farm these aphids. So the ants come and guard over uh, colonies of aphids, protect them from predators. And in exchange, they go around and eat up the <laughs> sugar poop when it comes out. So here's some. All right, there you go. Honeydew slurp. So the focus isn't great, but it does seem to highlight the some of those honeydew droplets come through really nicely. So up here, there's a whole bunch of aphid butts. 
and they like raise their butt when they're ready to drop one of these honeydews and the ants could not be happier. All right, let's do one more. There we go. <laughs> I'd like that to be your ant job. I'm a butt farmer. It's the honest work. I uh, see we're running out of time. I think we got time for one more. This is a different kind of organism, a gecko that's also tending to some uh, relatives, leafhopper insects that do the similar thing. Most geckos feed on insects, but some take nectar from flies, and a few collect liquid from insects in much the same way as we take milk from cows. Insect, a tree hopper, is sitting head down drinking sap from the tree. It would be invisible were it not vibrating its abdomen. And that is what the gecko wants from it, a drop of honeydew. Honeydew is what remains of tree sap after the hopper has extracted the protein from it. It's very sweet, and the gecko plainly loves it. Other, less colourful species of gecko also drink honeydew, and some order it from the hopper by vibrating their heads. <laughs> the hopper tells the gecko that a drink is on the way by waggling its abdomen. How the hopper benefits from this arrangement is not clear. Perhaps the gecko keeps predatory insects away, and the honeydew is protection money. <laughs> All right, uh, just one more group of insects that are related to the aphids. I'm familiar with these as some of our greenhouse pests. So scale insects and mealy bugs are also related to aphids. These are also uh, piercing and sucking insects as well as the white flies. Um, one of the, the symptoms if you have a plant that's being fed on in this way is that there's like an abundance of sugar around. So they get sticky leaves or something like that because the again the sugar is sort of a byproduct of the as more than what the animals are interested in. All right, so we're uh, pretty well out of time here. So I'll stop there. We can wrap this one up next time. And I will bid you a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>